Good morning, good afternoon, wherever it is that you might be. I'm Woodrow Thomas of the Bella Vista Missionary Baptist Church with the Reverend Chicardi P. Davis is our senior pastor. Also, Reverend Kevin J. Abraham is pastor emeritus, and Douglas Phillips is our educational director. And today assisting me is Michael Hamilton with all the technical support in media. I want to say to each and every one of you, happy Thanksgiving, wherever it is that you may be. I know it's an unusual time for us. But we're looking forward to a great time, and I hope that it will be a marvelous and a memorable time. Of certainly, it will be for you and your family. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your kindness and your grace. Thank you for the privilege you've given to us to study your word. We pray now by the power of the Holy Spirit that it would guide us in clarity and understanding of this, your word of truth. For your word is truth. This we ask in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Our Sunday school lesson is week 12, uh, 22nd of November, and our general theme is love for one another. And that's one of the things, if you'll see, I'm going to try to highlight everything that I'm going through today. It'll be on the screen. Love for one another, and then also unit three. It's called Godly Love Among Believers. Our church theme is Our God Gives, Genesis, 1 Samuel, Luke, John, Acts, and uh, the epistles. And so we're in lesson 12 today called Responsive Love. The biblical application for our lesson today is going to be considering the consequences of your motives in serving God and others. And our key verse from our scripture today, which is coming to us from Acts 4, 30 through to 5 and 11, it will be, and the multitude that believed were of one heart and of one soul, no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. And that's Acts 4.32. And then I've uh, paraphrased the King James and the NIV together. So our Bible lesson context is to test your motives. We need to test our motives before you test God. I think that's really important because... You need to look into your heart and understand what it is that's going on. How are you in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to take one moment and let you think about what maybe it might be that you're not doing that you should do. Think about that. One second, a couple of seconds. I want you to think about that. What it is that God would have for you to do that you're really not doing. Think about it. All right. Hopefully that's coming to your mind as to what you have thought that maybe there are some things that you've left undone. Uh, the year's not over with, and uh, it's an opportunity for you to consider because that's one of the most important things. We're talking about responsive love. The definition of love is a great interest or a pleasure in something or someone. Love will always produce benefits that far outweigh the consequences of being unloving. And I paraphrase that from Priscilla Shire out of the book she wrote called Obedience. Some of the key words that we're going to be looking at in our text today is going to be one heart, one soul, all things common, great power, great grace, great fear. And there was not any among them that lacked or sold it or what they had. And they laid it at the apostles' feet. We're going to be talking about uh, the money, the apostles' feet, Satan filled your heart to lie. You have not lied unto men, but unto God. And then we're going to talk about the Ananias and Sapphira, and they buried them. The place is going to be Jerusalem. The names we're going to see in the text are going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to see the multitude, the apostles. Joseph or Joseph, according to what translation you're looking at, that is Barnabas. Peter, Ananias, Sapphira. And then also the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God. Some of the terms are going to be believed. And uh, one heart, one soul, possessions of land, houses, great power, great grace, and the resurrection. Let me give you a summary of the book of Acts. Acts is 28 chapters. The book is about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the festival day of Pentecost and the beginning of the church. It is also a bridge between the life of Christ, and which is in the Gospels, 
and the church. In contrast, it is a compilation of examples of the Holy Spirit in the life and how it can change one's lives. So let's move forward as we look into the context of where our lesson outline comes to us on today. Let me give you kind of a context in general because we're coming into the fourth chapter. We know if you've read the book of Acts, Peter and John meet a man at the gate of called Beautiful. That's in chapter 3. And we know that they tell him uh, he is in need of arms. They say, silver and gold have we none, but such as we have give we thee in the name of Jesus Christ. And they grab him by his hand and they lift him up. And the Bible says his feet and his ankle bones gain strength. We know that he went into the temple with them, leaping and praising God. But then when we come into that fourth chapter, there are some questions about that. They take him before Annas, and that's in uh, verses 6. Annas the high priest in Caiaphas and John and Alexandria. And many of those who were kindred to the high priest, and they were gathered together in Jerusalem. They bring them before them, asking them, what is this about this great power that you are talking about? And they are trying to discourage them in speaking the word of God. They told them that uh, they would not hold their peace. And so therefore they released them because they understood they could not... Uh, discharge from their mind and their understanding what they saw. Here's a man that they had seen at the temple gate for many years. He's 40 years old. And now he stands there before them, healed, walking, and being able to praise the Lord. So therefore, there's a problem there. And so therefore, they let them go. And we come to the point of the context of where our lesson is today. Because... Of what has happened, there's another verse that is very, very important. Just in the fourth verse of that fourth chapter, it says that many of them believed and about 5,000 men, their lives were changed. Something is happening because of this Holy Spirit, this promise of a comforter that Jesus has told them that he would, after his departure, that would come upon them. Here it is, we see some evidence that the promise is being fulfilled and lives are being changed. And so they, they come to the point of verse 32, and I want to read the context of our lesson. I'm just going to read it straight through from chapter 4, verse 32 to 511. And it says, And the multitude of them that, that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither had any of them they at aught the things that he possessed of his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power, they gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. And as many as was possessors of the lands and of houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that they were sold. And laid them at the apostles' feet. And distributing was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles surnamed Barnabas, which is to be interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyrus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5, verse 1. Here's the, here's the, the change of what they would call the tension in the text. It says, but a certain man... Annas and Sapphire, his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not in thine own, and after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart, and hast not lied unto men, but unto God? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them of these things. 
And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. And Peter said unto her, how is it that thou hast agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them that have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. And then she fell straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, burying her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. That's the end of our reading and the completion of our context. We come to the first portion of our lesson that talks about a sharing community and that's Acts 4, 32 and 35. A unified example, the multitude of them believed the Lord, one heart, one soul and had all things in common. Their possessions were not their own. That's one of the things I think that is very important to us, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of light. We must understand that all belongs to him because when we leave here, we leave everything that we've come into this world and acquired, it still remains here. It is not our own. So therefore, we cannot let things have us. It's no problem and nothing wrong with enjoying the things of this life, but the things of this life should not direct or control you. So therefore, they sold the things that they had, their possessions. This is a loving example, and this is something that I think that is very important for us. We, as a member of this church, Bella Vista Missionary Baptist Church, one of our things is we are the church that cares. That means that we try to, at times, to show loving, caring, concern for, for others by doing things we've had uh, food programs, food giveaways, and, and we give away gifts. At, at, at present, we are, we are putting together uh, a program to give away some gift cards to try to help some needy people. Those things are vitally important because it exemplifies the love of Christ that is within us. And so therefore, they had a loving example. There was not anyone who had need or lack. If what you have, there's always more than enough. I think if you remember the last time we were together, I told you that um, one of the uh, guest ministers uh, who had come with us asked everybody to reach in their pocket and pull up a dollar, and everybody held up a dollar. And he stated to them that then you have uh, just enough to help somebody else with. And that's really most important. We all have more than enough. All we have to do is try to reach out, and that means that when we do so, God has uh, a responsibility to assist us in whatever it is that we're trying to do. So the question is, what have or are you withholding from God? That's another question, something for you to think about. Is there something maybe you're not giving as you should? Maybe uh, you're not being as committed as you should to God? Maybe you have not been as faithful? Maybe when things were well and before COVID, when you had opportunities to come and do things and maybe somebody had asked you to get involved, you didn't do it. So those are things I think you're withholding from God because many times people give you opportunity in order that God may work in your life and to grow you. So think about that when you're able to return and maybe think about that now. What can I do to help somebody else to let someone else know that God loves them? Our second section of our lesson talks about Barnabas' positive example, Acts 4, 36 through 37. It's an interactive, and it's an example of unselfish kindness. He sold his land. He brought his money. He gave it to the apostles. Unselfish love. That's why they call him a son of encouragement. Because you know something, when somebody does something for you, that's an encouragement. It should be. There are many times, and, and I can call names. I'll, I'll say this. Uh, Sister Ruby Hub has an unusual way of just at the right time sending a card in the mail. Same thing with uh, Sister Ernestine Shaw. Those people send us things. They send us cards. They say things. Uh, uh, Betty uh, Skelton 
has the same way of doing it. Sometimes it's in an email that she sends. Uh, Shirley Harpin sometimes sends me a little note. And uh, Janet Williams sometimes sends me something, some little notes of encouragement. Many of us have done the same thing. Those things lift our spirit. Those things encourage us to keep on fighting on and moving forward. And I think that what's showing is that's unselfish love. That's love that somebody is showing to you. Somebody is saying, I'm in this with you. I've got some difficulties. I've got some troubles, but I'm concerned about how are you doing. And, and that means a whole lot. Barnabas cared. He saw what he has because he realized that it didn't belong to him. It was not his, even though he was enjoying it, even though it, it's his, there, there's the thing that my wife and my family do. We realize the fact, we thank God for when we leave home in the morning, have a prayer, and then when we come home, we thank God that what he has given to us is still there. There have been times that, uh, I remember recently, uh, someone broke into my wife's car, just totally knocked the windows out and got in the vehicle. But I realized the fact when they asked me, how do you feel about it? I said, well, it, it's, it's a gift from God. And he'll work it out, and I know he's got a place, someone who can fix it. And yes, he did. He took care of everything, and he worked it out. Even though we never found out why and what the purpose of the person wanting to break into the vehicle, but still, we had the vehicle repaired, and everything is okay. No one was injured, and that was really most important that we were not in the vehicle when it happened. Think about the things that God does for you. Remember, you remember the lesson that we talked about here about the parable of response where we had a certain Samaritan? That was in our lesson seven on uh, the 18th of October. It was called a Lucian parable, uh, Luke 10, 29 to 37. We talked about this certain Samaritan, the example of compassion. He bandaged the man's wounds. He moved the wounded man to a safe place. He provided for him additional care. He made arrangements for his place of rest. And then also he made provision. He gave them a promise that if it, if it was anything additional that he needed to pay, he would be more than happy to pay it. Those are the things that I think that we need to look at. And the question is, if your desire to help someone required you to sell or give away something of value, what would you do? Would you, would you be willing to do it, or would you question what is the need to be able to do it? So those are the things that I think that are most important. And be mindful, what we do daily either embarrasses or exemplifies Christ. So what you're doing today, wherever you might be, when you're listening to this, or whatever your, your preparation for Thanksgiving, or a lot of people are already moving toward the Christmas and New Year's preparations, Whatever it is, whatever you do, be mindful that somebody else can come to know Christ through the example, or you can really be an embarrassment. You know, a lot of people now, it's is tension where we go. People are intense at the, at the gas station. People are intense at the, the grocery store, at the shopping center. People, people are intense uh, even in traffic find people get behind you, they just run right up on your bumper, and sometimes they blow your horn, they just want you to get out of the way, and there's no way for you to, to go. And sometimes you've got to hold your peace. I know it's difficult sometimes. Sometimes we want to respond back to them. We want to honk our horns back, and, uh, and maybe even more, unfortunately. But still, it's our responsibility to understand that we're exemplifying the love of Christ. Let's go to our last outline, at lot three. Ananias and Sapphira, the test of God, Acts 5, 1 through 11. This is a sad example. This interacting, it's a question of character. What would you have done if it had been you that God had blessed you and, and, uh, and you had sold what you had? Are you honest enough to be able to do that? Let me, let me back up a little bit. Did you give God anything out of your stimulus money? Well, that's a good question. It's probably reaching, reaching a hard point with some of us. Do we write, is, is the check to the church in our tithes and offerings the first thing that we give? Are we supporting the capital campaign? We're trying to do a major renovation here. In order that, it'll be some place that'll be beautiful, that'll glorify God, 
but it also be there are other advancements and things that are being added uh, for your enjoyment. Are you participating? Those are some questions that you need to ask. Uh, yes, uh, I know tax time is coming. You're going to pay your taxes. I, I hope so. And all the other things that you're supposed to do. But then don't shortchange God. Let me give you a point of something that I used to do. My wife and I, when we uh, first became members here, uh, we didn't have very much. And we still don't. Um, but uh, I know it came to a time after our son was born that things were very close. The finances were very, very tight. And what we would do, we would look at our checkbook and we would say, we're not going to stop tithing. We're not going to stop giving our building fund and our offerings to our, our groups. But what we're going to do is we're going to write in our checkbook, I owe you, and put an amount next to it. And that's what we did. We found an area in the back of our checkbook and we wrote it and called it the IOUs to God. And we would write down, every time we were short on our tithes, we would write an IOU. But every time God gave us a little over a little bit over what we had had before, we would subtract from our IOU. And eventually in time, it took us a while, but eventually in time, our IOU existed no more. And then God made provision and we were able to, because he knew our heart. Our heart was that we wanted to do this, but also we had other responsibilities. And God did not hold it against us because he knew that we had desired that we want to give him what we owe him. And in time, we were able to do that. Think about that for yourself. Maybe you're not tithing now. Maybe you're not supporting the things of the church right now. Maybe you need to start someplace. Start with a dollar a week. Start with $2 a week or $3 a week. Put it someplace and say, Lord, it's difficult, but I'm going to give this to you. Let's look at Ananias and Sapphira. They sold a possession. They had something to sell. They did not share all they made. They lied when they were challenged. Will a man rob God? I think that's what the, that one of the scriptures tells us. Because that's what you're doing is you're robbing God. It all belongs to him. He gives it to us and an entrustment. And when we obey him, it strengthens us in our faith did not share all that they had, they had made. It said they died because they forgot God knows all. God is omniscient. He sees everything. He understands everything. He knows all about it. I think the most important thing is for us to, to understand is that we are have control. God trusts things to us. They died because they lied to God. They sinned. Another question for us is, are you led of God most often? Do, do you allow God to lead you in the things that you're doing? You allow God to, to guide you as to who you would like to help? Maybe there's somebody right now who needs, you know, maybe, maybe part of just a caring concern. Maybe you've got a gift of baking pies and, or doing certain things or making certain little items. This would be a great season to encourage somebody Share what you have with them. Give something. It may, not, it may not be very much, but it could be monumental to the person who is going to receive it. When and where and who and how is responding to the needs of other neighbors. How are you responding to the needs of others? People especially whose names you will know, and you probably will never meet them again. Some person who's on the street corner today, you've probably seen them there for a long time. It would be great to prepare something to try to share with them in this season. And then put a card with it. We have some cards around here. Or just write them a note and say, God loves you. He cares for you. What is your answer? How will you respond? Let me give you a final word. It said that he keeps God's commands. God dwells in him by his Holy Spirit. And that's in John 3, 23 and 24. It's a time of transition and decision for us. And so I want to leave you with the, the last few things that I want to say to you today as I've always said when we had this time together. No life, no God. No life, no God. That's great wisdom. 
Trust God in all of your life situations. That's the thing that I want to leave with you today as we're talking about a responsive love. A responsive love. That means that the love is going to do something. It lets other people know that Christ is alive and that God is well. We say we thank you. Thank you for allowing God to use you. Now this is a season of Thanksgiving and I pray that you're going to uh, consider the words of our text on today. Coming to us out of Acts 4. 32 through 5 and 11, I believe it will be a blessing to you. Try and see what God will do in your life. I guarantee you, you'll see a seed in abundance beyond all you can ask or think. He will reward you. I thank you for the time that you've given to me today to come and to be with you. And I challenge you to be obedient to the word of God. And I pray that you'll find encouragement in God's word on today. Let us pray. Thank you, our God, for all that you have done. We're grateful for the privilege you've given to us to spend this time together. We look unto you because we know that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We know that you know all about it, and we know that this is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. I thank you for the medium that uh, allows for us to go out into homes and across this country. I thank you for the privilege you've given to us. But most importantly, I thank you for your word because it challenges us. It guides us. It strengthens us. It convicts us as to how we should live and be obedient to your will. Help us now at this COVID time. Many people who are sick, touch them, give them strength. Many who are bereaved now, will sit at their tables, will come together in an unusual way. Their loved ones will no longer be there. Oh God, but help them today. Oh God, guide them and strengthen them today. We ask that you would be at the table with us during this Thanksgiving season. We give thanks unto you for your grace and your mercy and your loving kindness and for all that you have done. Would you bless us Bless this ministry of believers at the Bella Vista Missionary Baptist Church under the leadership of Pastor Carpe Davis. Bless our, our pastor emeritus, Reverend Calvin Abraham, our director of education, Douglas Phillips. Thank you for our meeting ministry on today. We pray, O oh God, that you would use us to your glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name we put our faith. Thank God. God be with you until we meet again.